Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all his love for me. Yes, his love for me. To the sun sets free, always oh, free.
together Strange as neighbors Our blood is one Children of generation Of every nation His kingdom come Don't let your heart be troubled Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you So take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our hell comes from singing voices warmed up. We're awake and it's Father's Day and we're celebrating all the fathers and our Father in heaven. Let's sing. Swing wide, all you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. Name is Jesus. Let's sing that again, church. Swing wide, all you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Across the room, let's sing it out. Swing wide, all you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. Our creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus.
I do have one announcement to make real quick. Uh, we are doing, if you do have a student that's in middle school or high school or going into middle school or high school, we are gonna get together. We haven't picked a lake, but it will be a close lake and we're gonna do like a, a youth group get together the second weekend of August. Uh, we're gonna have a boat out there. We're gonna fish, we're gonna have archery. We're gonna have a bunch of yard games. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, we're going to be grilling out and stuff like that. Uh, I will make another announcement later this summer and tell you exactly where and exactly when we're going to do that. But if you do have a student that's going to be in middle school or high school, um, introduce yourself to me. I would love to meet your your child or or grandchild or whatever, whoever that is to you, and uh, get them involved in the in the student ministries. Um, like I said, my name's Sydney. I'm the youth pastor here. Um, I've always been, since I was a kid, I've always been involved with the church. And I've come to find out as we're in this, in this Tough Topics uh, sermon series, I've come to find out throughout my life that almost any biblical topic is a tough topic because the Bible is anti-world culture. It goes against our own sin nature. So any topic we discuss when it comes to what God wants us to do could be a tough topic. And as a kid growing up, something I struggled with, and just a little snapshot into my life, I did VBS, I did Sunday school, I was a VeggieTales kid all through the 90s, I, Madam Blueberry, Junior the Asparagus, I knew all of them. I knew Silly Songs with Larry. But there was something always, and it's really funny reading it now, but Psalms 23, right? As a kid, if you grew up in, in my generation, every Sunday school teacher wanted you to memorize Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That was a phrase that I got stuck on as a kid all the time. I'm like, okay, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And in my mind, I'm like, wait, how, why would I not want the Lord is my shepherd. Why would I not want the Lord is my shepherd? Well, that was silly of me, right? It was silly of me as a kid because I didn't know context. I didn't know the rest of the Bible. I'm just memorizing this one small piece. The Lord is my shepherd, comma, I shall not want anything of this earth. The Lord's going to give me what I need, right? I didn't understand the full context of the scripture. But I saw it as the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, goodness, I don't, no, I don't want a shepherd. I don't want to get hit with a staff. I'm not a sheep. You know, that was my mindset. Small twists of God's word can be confusing to us, can get us going in the wrong direction. The word is described as a double-edged sword, is, is described as a double-edged sword in Scripture. But I want to confirm with you tonight that God's morals are never contradicting, never compromised. The worldly culture has always been obsessed. The world has always been obsessed with trying to find ways to completely reject the Bible or twist its words to fit our own sinful nature. The original sin in the garden, the devil said, surely you will not die this instant. Go ahead and take of this fruit. And that was the original sin. The, the, the devil took something God said and twisted it just enough to make it sound appealing. And that's okay for the word to be questioned. As long as you have the want to keep digging. We ask for wisdom and we shall receive it. I want to know the answers to these, these tough topics, so I need to dig. God wants us to dig into his word. Every biblical, every biblical based topic is a tough topic because the Bible is countercultural and calls us to resist our sinful nature. One opinion I hear the most when it comes to completely dismissing everything the Bible says, they want to find one thing that they think that God contradicts himself or is compromising to what we believe is a good and perfect God they want to expose. And one thing I hear all the time is, well, there is slavery in the Bible, and I'm against that, so I can't believe in the Bible. God condones slavery. It says it in the Old Testament. There's slavery in the Bible, and I'm completely against that, so therefore God's not good, and I'm not going to believe anything he says. Well, that statement is intellectually lazy and holds no meaning without understanding the, the Bible and the context of the words in it. Now, I was first probably exposed to uh, what we know as slavery in our American culture, and it being the 4th of July, we love our freedom. 
And if, us Americans, we love our freedom. We shoot off big old fireworks to let people know we love our freedom. Big booms, big shows, lights, you know, kids covering their ears like, oh my gosh. And the parents are like, yeah, freedom, right? We love it. We love our freedom. But part of our past is that there was slavery in our country. And that is our, our picture. When we hear the word slavery, we go to what we've been exposed to in our schools. When I was in seventh grade, I watched the movie Roots. And that was probably my first real exposure to what slavery was like in the mid-1700s to 1800s, pre-Civil War slavery. And it was brutal. And there was nothing good about it. So the basis in pre-Civil War slavery was based completely on race. They even tried to come up with scientific explanation why one race was inferior to the other and why they could master and lord over one. Lobes in the brain, color of the skin, whatever the case may be, wasted thousands and thousands of intellectual hours to try to support what they believed was true, which was not truth. The treatment of slaves was subhuman. Beating slaves was something that was commonly done. It was a common practice. Forcing someone out of their homeland to work for you. And the basis was economic. It was an economic basis. Free labor that this slave will have a kid and I will have free labor for the rest of my days. As long as I have a slave, I don't have to pull the plow. I don't have to do the work. And the economic piece is the only, probably the only piece that we can actually put together that could actually be put together with the slavery in the Bible because it was economic based. It was not based in race. So in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and even into the New Testament under Roman law, the slavery was, I was a person, if I were a slave, I was somebody that was indebted. I had a debt. I was poor. I was not able to take care of myself. So what I would do is I would give my services to be a servant, if I could cook, if I could do something, work in the field, pull, pull whatever the case may be. I would voluntarily give myself to a family that would take on my debt. And then I would work for that person and work my debt off. That's biblical slavery. There's one passage that people bring up every time when they talk about Bible and slavery. And this is the problem with taking a scripture, putting it in one context, and only reading that one context. We're going to skip to Exodus 21, 20, verse 21, 20 through 21. Exodus 21, 20 through 21. Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But if they are not to be pun they are not to be punished if the slave recovers a day or two in a day or two since the slave is their property. In that just quick snapshot in Exodus, that looks like that could be a direct relation to what we see as pre-Civil War slavery, right? That looks pretty brutal. But we know that God's context, that he cares about his people. He is compassionate for his people. So let's go to Exodus 21, 16. Let's look before this verse. What does God say? Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. So in one verse, in Exodus 21, 16, whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. And this one verse undercuts that lazy comparison from pre-Civil War slavery to biblical slavery. God says, you will never force a man to work for you. You can't do it. And the penalty was death. Kidnapping was punishable by death in the book of Exodus. Because God cared that much about human rights, even the Old Testament. People will say, well, the God of the Old Testament is wrathful and he kills people. And he does He cares about people. He cares about our individual freedoms. He cares about our freedom to choose. This verse shows us that. Exodus 21, 20 through 21. Let's read it again. If anyone beats their male or female slave with a rod, must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But not, but they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two since the slave is a property. Now, punished in this sense, in the original Hebrew word, the word punished is actually the death penalty. 
So it's an eye for an eye. You kill your slave, you are to be killed. If you mistreat someone that severely, then you shall be killed. I would say that's a God of compassion, a God that doesn't want people beat, that doesn't want people stolen. If we read further down, Exodus 21, 26 through 27, 26, an owner who hits a male or female slave in the eye and destroys it must let the slave go free. Once again, undercutting the lazy con- comparison because of a word from pre-Civil War slavery to biblical slavery, right? In one, in another verse, undercuts that. If you hit your slave and he can't see, you must let the slave go free. In compensation for the eye, 27, and an owner who knocks out the tooth of a male or female slave must let the slave go free in compensation for the tooth. The people that bring up the verse verse in Exodus that talks about beating the slave and not being punished never brings this part up. Never brings this part up. If you bodily, if you harm, cause any bodily harm to your indentured servant or the person that voluntarily gave themselves to you, trusting that you're going to take care of their debt for them, if you harm them, you, their debt is paid and, you, and they go free. That does not resemble at all pre-Civil War slavery or what we see in America or what we, what we know is slavery in America, the slave trade of the human flesh. God tells us even in the Old Testament that that's something he despises, that if you do that, you should be put to death. If you kidnap someone, you take them against their will, you should be put to death because you're stealing their life away from them. So even Old Testament God, who people see as some wrathful, overarching person that bears down and doesn't give any mercy or grace, seems pretty merciful and graceful to even the slave. Because he counts us all as equal. He doesn't see a master above a slave. He sees us all as human beings and you should treat others the way you want to be treated. That's what it's saying here. Jesus repeats that in the New Testament. Never once are God's morals compromised. Where do you think those morals come from that you want to be free? Freedom is a God concept. It's not some guy sat in a book in 1776 and wrote it down on a piece of paper and it's like, yeah, this freedom thing is an American thing. No, it's a God concept. To be free. We'll jump into the New Testament. Jump into there. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.10. The sexually immoral is the sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, translated as kidnappers as well, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Being an enslaver or a kidnapper is contrary to sound doctrine. So we now see in Old Testament through the New Testament that God's God's compassion for those who are enslaved and who are kidnapped does not change. He loves them. He wants them to be free. Not once in the Bible can you show me a verse where he condones what we see as cultural slavery in our culture in America in the mid-1700s to the mid-1800s. He doesn't condone it once. But people will take small bits of the Bible to try to make you think that God contradicts himself. And it's just lazy Bible study. The very idea of being someone who takes a man or a woman against their free will has never... Old or New Testament, something that God has been vague about, or let alone condoned. So we see a cultural shift in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, God is building his nation, right? The Israelites escape from uh, Egypt, and he's building a nation of his people. So he's regulating, hey, if you're going to do this indentured slave, as you're going to give yourself up, you also have rights and protections, Right? You have rights and protections. Now, in the New Testament, in the New Testament where the church is being built, he's speaking to us as individuals, right? Because he now dwells inside of us ever since he gave his son on the cross. So we have the Holy Spirit. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he's speaking to those, to a government that already regulates how slavery and things like that. It's a cultural shift. 
God gives us advice on all sorts of things, right? So the New Testament is him giving us advice, telling us how we should live our lives in order to live a fulfilled life, a joyful life, a peaceful life. God gives us, an, gives us advice on how to deal with persecution, right? He tells us how to deal with it. But that does not mean it's okay to persecute Christians, right? He tells us how to deal with trials, but that doesn't mean it's okay to put someone through trials. He tells us to turn the other cheek. That does not give us permission to slap one, of, one cheek of every person in this room. That's, God is not condoning that action, but he's telling us how to react to our situations. So we'll shift into some slavery in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 7, 20 through 24. Each one, of, each one should remain in the condition in which he is called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself that opportunity. So if you can become free, be, become free. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of, of the Lord. Likewise, he, he who is free and is called to a bondservant of Christ, he who is free when is called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become called. Do not become called there. Let him remain with God wherever you are called in whatever condition it was in. So what that's speaking to is we're, no matter what our situation is, if you're called to Christ and you have him in your heart, his will for you, carry that out in whatever situation that may be, freed or not. Like we, in our, so in our culture today, how that, would, how that would translate was, if you're working a nine to five, keep working your nine to five. It doesn't mean you have to quit your job and go be an overseas missionary in order to carry out God's will. You can carry out God's will right here. But don't enslave yourself to the things of this world like money to where you can't give your time to do God's will. He tells us no matter what the situation, we are to be diligent and do what his word tells us to do. He lets us know over and over again that this life only temp is only temporary and his eternal gift is worthy of any kind of suffering on this earth. Any kind of suffering, no matter the situation. Like, my friends tell me, you know, I do work a full-time job. I'm not paid by the church. I'm not on staff here. I do work a full-time job on top of being the youth pastor in, in Philly and Frosted. If you own your own business, make your own hours, man, you, you'll be free. I mean, really, we're just, we're, we're literally just shifting our masters here, right? I have a boss that I answer to. I clock in on a time clock and I get a paycheck, right? So therefore... In the nine, nine to six hours that I work throughout the day, depending on what day of the week it is, I need to do what my boss asked me to do, right? And I have to do that diligently. But while I'm doing that, I need my life to represent what God wants it to be. I'm not shameful about me being a Christian in the workplace. I don't keep that quiet and hidden under a bush. But the way I live my life and the ethics and the morals that I stand by cannot be compromised by my job. This life is only temporary. Whatever situation you're in, don't waste time on trying to find the most free time you possibly can. Fit God into every single compartment of your life. Don't compartmentalize. Put him overarching. He is the overarching theme of our life. Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. This is another passage that people, people oftentimes, oftentimes use to um, zero in on one part and one part only and be like, well, this is God condoning slavery again. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, so don't do it just for show. Don't make work, don't make your job, your nine to five, the things you do to make a living so you can have a roof over your head. Don't make your, your faith a show for those people at work. But as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with all goodwill 
as to the Lord and not to man. Do your work for the Lord and not for man. If you try as hard as you can at your job and whatever it is that you clock in and you make money doing, if you do that as hard as you can, as if you're doing it for the Lord, I guarantee your boss will be pleased with you. Think about it. If my boss, if the Lord told me to get a spreadsheet done in 10 minutes, I bet you I get that spreadsheet done in about seven and a half minutes, right? Because that, Right? If it's God asking me to do it, it's probably a little different than, than my boss who yells at me all the time or whatever the case may be, tells me to get a spreadsheet done. Yeah, I can wait until tomorrow. I probably would never react like that if God said, hey, I need you to get this spreadsheet done. Or I need you to do this. Or I need you to do that. I need you to clean these toilets for me. Whatever your job is, it's not lowly. Do it as you would do it for Christ. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. Whether he is a bondservant or he is free, whether he is a bondservant or he is free, masters, do the same to them. So in the beginning, this is where people snapshot just verse five, um, verse five, and they say, bondservants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you, were, as you would Christ. They take that one snapshot, they're like, there it is. Bond servants, slaves, depending on your translation, they said, there it is. Fear your master like you fear God. There's, God. there's there's God condoning slavery. But what we don't do is look at the flip side of it. Like we went over 1 Corinthians verse 7 uh, earlier this, this summer, and it talks about the duties of the man and the wife. And usually husbands love to read the wife part and wife love to read the husband's part. Like that's, you know, we like to like show each other. Well, this is what the Bible says you should do. Well, this is what the Bible says you should do. You know, women will bring up Ephesians 5.25, wives in the room. Ephesians 5.25, husbands sacrifice for your wives as Jesus did for his people. Well, you're not being an Ephesians 5.25 husband right now, right? Like we take these snapshots of, 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 of scripture and we like to use them. Maybe in a wrong way. But what they don't read is verse 9. Masters, do the same to them. And stop your threatening. Knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven. And there is no partiality with him. God's your master. It doesn't matter what your status is here on earth. Whether you're a master or you're a slave. He doesn't see you as either. He sees you as a human, his creation. He cares about you as a master, if you're a master or a boss, and he cares if you're a slave or a worker. He doesn't love one more than the other. So if you're in a position where you do get to boss people around, stop with the threatening. Know that who is both their master and yours in heaven. And there's no partiality with him. He does not favor one more than the other. God sees us all as equal, which also contradicts the lazy comparison of biblical slavery to pre-Civil War slavery. God's morality doesn't change with what your social status is. So we need to understand God's word when it comes to the slave and master relationship, right? So Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And it's so important that it was listed in two gospels, almost word for word, Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters for he will will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. What is it telling us in Matthew 6, 24 and Luke 16, 13? That we're all servants. We're all slaves to something. We give our our time and our money to something. In our culture, we're a slave to something, right? We serve something, a job. We, We sign 30-year mortgages. We do 60-month uh, car payments. We Money, power. We become a slave to social status, substance. 
There's a lot of things we can become slaves to on this earth, but we get to choose what we serve and who we serve and where we devote our time and where we devote our money. Going back to 1 Corinthians, highlighting verse seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 22. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when he is called is a bondservant of Christ or a slave to Christ. He is our master when we choose him. Why? Because the, the original Greek word of slave or bondservant is the word doulos, which means indebted to. Why, when we choose Christ, are we now a slave to him? Because he paid a debt that we cannot repay. He gave us a gift that we don't deserve. His son on the cross. The sin and shame and the brokenness of this world had separated us from God. And God himself, our master, gave himself as a sacrifice so that we could be with him one day in heaven. To give us eternal life. In Romans 1.1, Paul refers to himself as a servant or slave of God. 2 Peter 1.1, Simon, Simon Peter calls himself a servant or slave to God. Why is that? Because they both know what Christ gave and what debt he paid off that they would never be able to pay back. It shows us how slavery was set up in biblical times. That it was a voluntary, indent, it was a voluntary giving of your life to another family who could take care of your debt. Where you decided instead of starving to death that you were going to work for this family and give your life to them. I choose this over death. I would rather work my entire life than to die. We should be, we should with confidence and honor call ourselves slaves to God. Why? Because he paid a debt we can't repay. We don't have the capability because of the sin and brokenness of the world. And the fruits of our labor to God is more than any other master can give us. What are the fruits of serving the world? A sweet car? that won't be so sweet in five years? A house that inside the 30 year mortgage, you're gonna have to replace the roof and fix the water heater, temporary stuff. But what does God give us here on this earth? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. People will search their whole lives in the world and serving different masters to try to find that list. He gives that to us when we accept him here on earth. But more importantly, he gives us life eternal with the creator, not only the creator of us, but this universe of time, space, and matter. He created us to serve him. If I told you, if I said the name John Newton, I don't know if it'd ring a bell with a lot of you in this room. Maybe it would. He was a slaver, a slave trader. He's a wretched guy, worked probably the worst job in history, right? But the most despicable job in history is stealing people and taking them into slavery. His ship was almost wrecked one night and he prayed to God above, this guy he'd heard of, please shift the ship and don't let the hole, the hole take on water and please save me, Lord. And he did. His ship didn't wreck, his slaves didn't die, and neither did he. From that moment, John Newton's heart was changed. He served God diligently. He gave up the things of this world. He quit practicing the, the trading of human flesh and started following God the Father and started putting his life work into eternal things. John Newton is the author of the song Amazing Grace. Now, if you think about the words of that song and you know what John Newton's past was, God's grace saved a wretched man by paying his debt of sin. Only our God could come down and sacrifice himself to pay off our debt of sin and brokenness. And if you've taken that step and you've accepted Christ in your life, we invite you to take communion tonight. 
And as you take communion tonight, I want you to think about your relationship to your master who paid your debt. And that is God. We should confidently say that we are bond servants, that we serve Christ, that he is our master. Because nobody else and nothing else in this world can give us what he gave us. And that is his own life so that we may live for, for eternity. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you so much for this country that we can live in and, and worship you and get to know you and talk about you and, and open up and dive into your word. To take a deep dive and, and, and dismiss the things of this world and the false teachings of what your morality is. But we know, Lord, that your morality and your, and your, and your love for us is never failing and never wavering. As we go to communion tonight, Lord, I just pray that we, we think and we ponder and we pray on the debt that you paid, the sacrifice that you gave, the one that we can never pay back, that we can only give our lives to you. Lord, we thank you so much for that sacrifice. In your name I pray, amen. been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will say of the goodness of God and all my
much for worshiping with us this morning.